Moving on to our guest speaker today, Dr. Ed Lightfoot, uh, who um, the title is World Health Enthusiast and Clinical Radiology Trainee. But I've got an update. From Monday, you're going to be a consultant radiologist here in York. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and um, more importantly, Ed did his, some of his training here in York. So I think we can take another round of applause for that, actually. <laughs> and um, anyway, so welcome back to York, and I'm sure you'll have a fantastic time. And um, uh, and uh, I think you finished today old job and you start on Monday, so you have two days gap, don't you? I've had, I've had a couple of months off, to be honest. Oh, have you? All right, okay. I'll remember, I'll remember my, my stuff for when I can start on Monday. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and you're going to be specialising in head and neck as well, which is so, uh, so uh, And then um, uh, Ed uh, is from Carlisle um, and trained in, New in, in, in Newcastle. Uh, you know, before coming down here. So, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome you up to um, uh, take take the podium. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as I say, my name's uh, Ed Lightfoot. I'm a, a, a radiologist who's soon coming to, to York. Um, and this is my first visit to uh, York Medical Society. So I haven't seen any talks here. So I've hoped that this is something that's relatively interesting. I'm hoping... Level, but if I go off on some weird radiology tangent, someone just sort of shout at me or throw something or, uh, or, or something to get my attention, and I can change tact. But since I'm here, I should probably um, justify my, my existence here and give you some of my credentials about, um, well, why I'm here to talk to you about global health and from a sort of radiological perspective. Um, as kindly introduced, I went to Newcastle Medical. 2008 and 2013 and as in this sort of this NHS climate that we're in um, I took a couple of years out after my foundation years to predominantly work in in medical education but as part of that myself and my partner spent nine months to a year on and off working in Zambia which is where I really got an interest in, in global health. Um, out there we were doing general medicine and working in the bush but predominantly of, of clinical support work, well, community healthcare workers. Um, I had the very grand title of community healthcare worker training officer. Um, but while I was out there, I was applying for specialist training, deciding between becoming a GP with special interest in global health or going into the radiology sort of route. And I got my radiology training number um, while I was out there. And then, uh, so radiology training number and come to end uh, at the end of February of this year so when I CCT'd this is slightly um slightly delayed from some of my cohort because I took six months out um to do some global health radiology work with an NGO um which is what I'm predominantly going to be talking about today and as kindly introduced I should probably get used to saying it out loud but as of uh as of Monday I'm going to be a, a consultant radiologist in York with a special interest in head and neck radiology so I'm sure <laughs> so given my background i thought you know i'll have a single slide to give an overview of radiology that should be a fairly simple task so obviously very impartial um how important is radiology um pretty important uh in particularly in sort of a westernized sort of high income healthcare service radiology is is really really important in the, the of patients, particularly inpatient, um, but it, you'd be hard pressed to find a patient who comes through sort of a who comes through their their diagnostic pathway without passing through the imaging department at some point in in their trip. Um, Forty, obviously, slightly historic data now, but forty five point two million imaging tests in one year in the UK. In terms of radiology workforce, again, slightly historic, but four thousand one hundred twenty seven country divided per capita amongst 67 million population so we get roughly one radiologist uh, per 16,000 population 
So that's, you know, the UK is by no means sort of uh, stingy or it's been in no means sort of the most radiologists per number. It's actually pretty frugal when it comes to it. But my experience in global health is predominantly in the Gambia. So I'm going to use that as an example. And back in 2008, that I don't work with called RadAid, American, American NGO, um, did a deep dive into the radiology provision in the Gambia. And they found that there were 30 radio radiology workers in the country. So very, very different sort of cohort to radiologists. That includes, does include radiologists. It also includes radiographers. It includes technologists. So people who work the imaging machines and it includes assistants that they have to sort of help with the patients in the imaging departments. And that is 30 for the entire country. Um, in my experience, when I was out there, I met six radiologists in the country, and that was a really high number for, for the, uh, that, that included visiting professor from Nigeria and three Cuban radiologists. Um, so if we take the very different demographic, demographic of radiology workers, um, divide it amongst the population of 2.6 million, we still get one radiology worker per 87,000. So significantly different. And we know that there are differences in healthcare outcomes and there's health inequality in between sort of in between sort of uh, high income, uh, high money uh, healthcare system like the NHS and sub-Saharan Africa and low and middle income countries. And if you allow me to extrapolate slightly, I think provision of radiology, we know it's important. We know it's really useful in our diagnoses. So that's almost certainly going to be a contributing factor, however big or small, into that health inequality. So if you allow me to kind of make that, limp, that leap, I think that that makes sense. So if you talk to a radiologist, it's global health it, from a radiological perspective. Because if you talk to a, a diagnostic radiologist working in the NHS and in the UK, our job is so amenable to working from a distance a lot of us will work cross-site working from different hospitals with certain hospitals a lot of us will work have days working from home a lot of us will might even work for different institutions in the country different institutions across the country different institutions across the world so it's really really amenable to to but there's quite a lot of reasons why it's actually really different when working in a low and middle income country the most obvious sort of reason is that radiology requires some, some serious sort of hardware on the ground. If we want to look at a scan, if we want to look at a study, there needs to be something there that we've caught it, that we've, we've taken the study on. So things like CT scanners, MRI scanners, ultrasound scanners, and plain film sort of acqui acquisition units. What does all of this have in common? Yeah, <laughs> and particularly these lovely sort of these sort of high tech units that we've got, they're all pretty expensive. <clears throat> More likely what we're going to see when we go to low and middle income countries, what sort of their imaging provision, what that sort of technology that they have on the ground. More things that look like this, things that look like this. Perfectly capable of taking imaging to perfectly take, capable of taking diagnostic imaging. But pretty data compared to what we're used to and pretty towards the end of their functional life. But annoyingly, that's a big, a big output. That's a big re hurdle to get over in terms of why is radiology provision so different in, in a different, in these low and middle income countries. Um, but that's the easiest by far hurdle to overcome. So you'll find a lot of companies, a lot of charities, churches, organizations that are really, really good at raising money. They can raise a couple of hundred thousand, they can buy a CT scanner. And if they're even really good, they might even pay for the installation in these units. That's sort of the first, that's, as I say, that's the easy part. These sort of things don't exist in a bubble. Often if they've been donated, so from being used in the NHS or in a different healthcare system, They've, they've been flogged already. They've been used and used and used. And these things require maintenance. They'll go 
they'll be possibly the only scanner in this country um and so they will get used and they will get flogged and these things absolutely need upkeep and maintenance certainly from my experience the the ct scanner in the gambia where i worked um the nearest so could come and fix it was in senegal which was over a day's travel away they've got a lot of work to do in senegal as well so they've got have a pretty good reason to come and to come and visit to fix the the scanner that's the only scanner in the country so these things need to be maintained on top of that they also need a regular power supply so i mean if you've got a, an mri scanner an mri scanner is a really highly calibrated bit of kit it's a uh, it's a, an, a really really sensitive electromagnet that needs a constant power supply to be constantly on if you go into the mri scanner and start flicking the switch on and off it doesn't like it very much and then we're going to need sort of it someone to come fix that recalibrate it and that's a big big ask so people who visited sort of uh, sub-saharan african countries the the likelihood of getting a reliable power supply is not exactly sense <clears throat> but again that's not the only thing ideally if we've got a nicely calibrated setup and maintained bit of kit Ideally, when we're taking these images, we'd want them linked to a system which can archive the, the pictures, make them searchable, and link them to patient identifiable data so that when that patient comes back for a repeat scan, we can then compare it to the other one. Rather than wet film processing, which, you know, you print off their X for the patient, they take it home, they store it however they store it, and uh, if you're lucky, it'll come back. But in various states of, of degradation because they don't have the ability to store those things in the conditions that suppo they're supposed to be stored. And that's not everything. <laughs> Ideally, if you've got that PAC system working, then that should be linked to an electronic patient record because ideally you'd want all of the information, all of the biochemical tests that you've done in order to look at the interpret it correctly. And on top of all of that, Ideally, if you're getting teleradiology involved, then you need that to have reliable internet access or at least reliable network access so that it's linked to the rest of the hospital, the rest of the country, and ideally linked to the rest of the, uh, the rest of the world so that someone else can look at this information and, and take it on and to interpret that correctly. So if you allow me to be slightly facetious, you've got an organization donated a CT scanner, what they've actually signed up to is, uh, is install the CT scanner, provide long-term maintenance, and also maintain the, uh, the telecommunication system, power grid, and, uh, and hospital um, IT network for a sub-Saharan African country. So it's a bit, I suspect that a lot of the, uh, a lot of the organizations that do these, that raise this money, don't necessarily know what they're getting themselves into and probably bite off a bit more than they can chew. So back to me, very self-centered, I know. Excuse me. When I started my radiology training, my interest in global health from my previous experience, um, I was looking for opportunities that might arise but because of all of these reasons, actually, it's really difficult to find organizations that are doing sort of global health work from a radiological perspective. But from my initial sort of Googling, I didn't even find a, a, a decent website. What I actually found was uh, an uploaded PowerPoint presentation that was well from a consultant radiologist in who works with Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, who's Liz Yokes. Um, she'd given a, a talk to um, about some work that she'd done. I think it was via MSF um, and her work in working as a consultant radiologist in Malawi. Um, thankfully, that had an email address at the bottom, and I managed to email her as a as an ST1 radiology trainee who, and she was very happy that someone else was interested in in global health. Um, and by the time that Obviously, as an ST1, you're not particularly useful. Um, but by the time I'd gotten through my exams and I was ST3, ST4, I recontacted Liz and she had recently established a new charity. So this is worldwide I came to, to work with. Founded in 2017, um, initially with the, the view to improve sort of imaging access and, and access to 
radiological expertise um, across the world and try and narrow some of that radiological inequality and health inequality. Um, uh, now there's 35 long-term volunteers, I suspect there's more than that, um, who work with in a variety of different spheres, not just radiologists. Now there's radiographers and all sorts of people who are, who are really, really valued. They work in a number of different African countries. So as I say, Liz, Liz worked a lot in Malawi and my experience came in working in the Gambia. What we do is we, a lot of our work is in education and training. So online education, supporting sort of radiology trainees in um, wherever there is an established radiology training sort of system. So in Malawi, and we also mentor staff um, there's a huge deficit of radiologists in, in African countries. And so um, Karen Chikuti, who's one of the consultant, is a consultant radiologist who works in Malawi, I believe is the only consultant radiologist there. And so having some professional support from other radiologists is actually really valuable. Because there's such a deficit of radiologists, in order to try and narrow that imaging gap, we also do POCUS treat, uh, teaching. So that's point of care ultrasound. Or to a lot of other radiological tests is cheap and accessible. And if we can train non-radiology clinicians to do that, then that can go some way as to really helping sort of narrowing that gap, providing imaging and hoping, hoping to sort of support accurate testing and diagnosis. I'll come on to talk a little bit about our work with tele introducing teleradiology services. Um, and then they also do quite a lot of research and advocacy. So particularly at the time when I was getting in touch, um, we were looking to expand into the Gambia. Um, the Gambia is a sort of weird vermiform little country that's uh, set, nestled in the middle of Senegal, completely uh, surrounded all of its land border with Senegal. And I'm not sure if it, it does project okay. Um, with a small sort of um, the vast majority of the population uh, centred on that coast, it's a tiny little capital Banjul, but the big, um, the big population centre is in sort of the Kanafing, Fajara, Senegambia sort of region. Tiny little country. It's the uh, it's the smallest country in mainland Africa, fifty kilometres at its widest point. And there's this apocryphal story that the borders were drawn because a British ship sailed up the River Gambia, firing cannons off both sides. Or but it's a good story um and it, it's a previous british colony and along with that has a slightly tumultuous past um uh yeah there's various human rights accusations but while i was there they had a, a democratic and very successful democratic uh, election interestingly it's the only country in the world that votes with marbles in a sort of in thing and then yeah it was really interesting but it So why were worldwide radiology interested in getting involved in the Gambia? This is as often with these sorts of things. Uh, Liz, founder of Worldwide Radiology, and Karen, who is uh, the head of clinical services in, a, in the MRC, the Medical Research Council facility in the Gambia, happened to have worked together at some point and were in touch. And Karen was having some issues with the radiology uh, where she worked. And just said to Liz, is, is there anything you can do to help? And at this time, I was I was uh, also emailing Liz. And so dots were joined. And um, that's how it worked out. Serendipitous, as often these things are. But the Gambia was a really, really good centre to start a lot of these processes. Because historically, it being a British, a British um, an ex-British colony, it had the Medical Research Council really established um, research facility there. So it's obviously in this lovely leafy colonial uh, sort of compound with loads of sort of re really established research facilities, accommodation for, for the research scientists and the people who work there, a really, really reliable power supply because researchers don't really like it if the fridge goes off on their research samples, um, and all of the trappings of things that would make this actually a really, really good sort of trial to try and introduce some of these things. As I say, 
the MRC is a really, really established and really sort of prolific research center. Um, particularly this uh, this unit in the Gambia, it's really long standing, established in 1947, just after the war, and it's been really instrumental in sort of loads of really, really important research. So loads of vaccine research. Um, Loads of vaccine research proving the efficacy of and the improvement in population um, um, as part of vaccines. And really interestingly, the research basis for the use of insecticide treated nets in prevention of malaria comes from there. So it's a really like eminent research facility. And while I was there, there's obviously really important ongoing research. So giving empirical treatment for streptococcal infection in pregnant people, trying to prove that the 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 reduction in postnatal streptococcal infections and things like that. So really, really good. When you're doing research on a on a population, you, it's kind of in, kind of implied that you should probably look after that, the people who you're doing research on. Um, it's poor form not to. And so attached to all of the research parts of this, there's also a clinical service initially designed to sort of look after research participants and to um, look after staff members and family of staff members. But that's expanded to look after some of the local population as well. And that's kind of expanded a really busy outpatient department, sees 100, 120 patients a day, so undifferentiated patients with all manner of sort of problems. And then for the patients who need it, there's a 30 bed inpatient unit. I think that probably expanded a little bit now, actually, since I was there, but split over three wards. And the this is the uh, the ward. It's, this is the the clinical services in this lovely sort of nice, safe, pleasant compound, all very sunny. And um, as you can see, from, it's really this is Christmas. This is why there's some slightly questionable decorate decoration. Um, but you can see it's it's a really, really well funded and well sort of established ward. It's we've got Western Hospital hospital beds. It's clean and it's safe and it's a yeah. So it's a really, really good unit. The, the unit itself, in terms of me, um, sort of medical staffing, is there's five regular consultants who do all of the day-to-day -day sort of consultant work, ranging. If there's a pe so there's a couple of pediatric consultants. There's a ge general medical Karen, who's one of the who's the head of this unit. She's a British trained gastroenterologist, so she does endoscopy there. Um, there's an infectious diseases consultant who works in. Um, who works in London for three months of a year and spends nine months out in the MRC unit doing research and working. And there's family medicine. This is Dr. Abitan, who's uh, who's one of the pediatric consultants. And the day-to-day -day grunt work for June done by in the region of 12 medical officers. And that's a mix of Gambian trained doctors who've got jobs there, um, doctors from surrounding West, um, yeah, West African um, nations, and their numbers are bolstered to a certain degree by volunteers ranging from sort of F2 level to senior senior registrar to junior registrar sort of level. And so this is this is Tekken, who's a, a Cameroonian doctor with me. Some of the volunteer team here watching the World Cup with, uh, with the nursing staff when I was out there. In terms of radiology provision at the time, before I got there, they had plain film radiography, and that was acquired by a single static departmental unit. And this is uh, Al Gassim, who's one of the technicians doing a pelvic x-ray on their static unit. And they had two portable units for when sick patients were on the ward, or at the time, patients, um, in order to... Uh, to know what that is. Uh, <laughs> in order to, uh, to get... <laughs> And we also could do uh, could do um, ultrasound. And anyone who has worked in any sort of imaging might recognise these sonocyte edges. They're, I really, really hate them, but they were functional and they, they they do what they do. And this is Raphael, the radiographer, is doing an abdominal ultrasound. Sorry, I should have said all of the patients who have taken pictures of they all consented to the images being used. I should have said that at the start. Sorry. And all of this is hidden in my uh, in, which was my home for the uh, for my six months there, which was our little x-ray department this, in terms of staffing when i say if we think back to there were 30 in 30 radiology workers in the entire country i had the pleasure of working with four of them and 
I believe there was probably less than 10 radiographers in the country, and we were very lucky to have two of them. So Raphael is a Nigerian and trained in Ni Nigerian radiographer who trained in Nigeria, and Kumba is a um, is a Gambian um, radiographer who trained in Morocco because there's no radio radiography training in the Gambia, so it's all out sort of people that sent away to to courses and then brought back. And then we were we had Miss and Al Gassim who were technicians who were incredibly talented at what they do. So on paper untrained, but really 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 valuable assets. Prior to me getting there, no radiologist had ever had any input in the MRC there. All of the images, the plain film images, again, ticking one of our boxes, they had a rudimentary PACS, so a system that the images went to that they could see that were uploaded and archived online. Um, but all of the information was done by clinicians. Um, the ultrasound was undertaken by the radiographers, um, and no images are saved. They gave their report, and that was that was the ultrasound. So, what was I sent there to do? My uh, my role was essentially I had the very very defined role of improving X ray quality. Should be easy, yeah. Um, I was asked if I could improve ultrasound and with a bit more, particularly the quality of the report and the what really understanding what the clinicians need to know and letting the, the sonographers sort of focus on that. When I was there, I did do some radiologically guided interventions. Um, I am by no means an interventionalist, but I did do some little bits just as a proof of concept. But a large part of what I did was teaching was teaching and education. But ultimately, I understood before I went, I was a guinea pig. I was the first, certainly in terms of worldwide radiology and the, the organization, I was the first person to do a a long-term placement anywhere and certainly the first sort of trainee to do it at a trainee level similarly the mrc had never had anything like that um and so it was kind of scoping out whether this was a this was a viable thing that we were doing whether it was actually useful whether it was mutually beneficial got a picture of the most ridiculous guinea pig i could find <laughs> so in terms of improving x-ray quality when i got there this is the sort of test that we we were doing for the non-radiologically minded not normal oh. <laughs> um so what we've got here we've got some fluffy sort of airspace opacity up in this right apex which is probably some acute consolidation this is a bit of a chunky hilum and on the left we've got a pneumothorax someone has helpfully shoved a, a whopping great chest tube in there but if we look past the pathology on there then the quality of the x-ray is a bit naff, isn't it? The definition of, I mean, this is projecting actually quite well. Um, the definition of the bony definition there is really, really blurry. It's really over penetrated so that when we look at the sort of the, the between the ribs here, the definition of the lung parenchyma is pretty rubbish and we can't what's going on. We'd have to window and we'd have to sort of really, really, and there's a good chance that we're going to miss pathology here. Uh, any radiologist in the in the audience, uh, if you give me an hour, some rudimentary tools, and I'm left alone with the the X-ray sort of unit to take this, I will probably make it significantly worse, because um, my my basic uh, my basic uh, sort of X-ray physics uh, exam that I did four years ago did not prepare me to analyze image quality on a on an X-ray set from the 1990s. So I did, I was at a bit of a, a, a loss here as to what I could do. Luckily, our um, technician Argasim came to me soon after I started and said, oh, "Actually, I've been I've been toying around with some of the parameters. I think I've got it looking. I think I've I prefer what I've what I've been producing." And he showed me an X-ray like this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I saved again. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if we look at the quality of this, we've got really, really good definition. We've got really sharp bony lines and looking at the lung parenchyma, we can see we've got we can see some of the vascular structures. We've got a little slightly suspicious and concerning nodule here, here and probably another one somewhere over here as well. Um, so I guess, I guess I agree. This is significantly better. And previously he sort of had got a lot of pushback from some of the clinicians being like, 
no, we want it how it's always been. Mm -hmm. So this is still touted as probably the longest lasting and most important change that I did while I was out there. And my my entire role in this was to have the word doctor in front of my name and to be reassuring to them, that, no, you'll get used to it. It's better, trust me. <laughs> so this is now the sort of quality of, of x-rays that we're, we're producing there. And it's all down to, to our gassing, really. So one tick, six. If you look at the next picture, there it's a lot night and day, isn't it? So in terms of improving up the sound, again, this was, my, my job here was pretty simple because Raphael and Kumba are really, really, really highly trained, really capable and really keen radiographers with a good background in sonography. As I say, doing some things like obstetric ultrasound, I, Raphael did that, I didn't touch it because <laughs> he was much more experienced. What they weren't experienced with was in, all, in communicating to their findings and having the the backing to say what they thought to the clinical team. Because of their training, they didn't really feel confident to say, no, this is my findings and this is what I think it is. And all it took from me was owning some of their reporting skills, some of their communication skills and getting them to talk to the, the doctors on the wards being like, no, no, these, these guys are the, the imaging experts. You guys have asked for this test. And a lot of it was actually getting the clinicians to ask the right questions to these guys. So this is this is Raphael doing a, a departmental ultrasound, and then I also took out one of these new butterfly ultrasound probes. Um, so we did some some ward based stuff as well. So I was two for two while I was out there. And anyone who knows me, I am very much not an interventional radiologist, but in my day to day work, I do stick some needles into necks and things like that. Proof of concept. I thought I can show the clinicians how useful radiology can be in that sort of regard. So this is me on the ward sticking, a, a, well, draining a, a leg abscess. I say leg abscess. This leg was more abscess than leg, really. Uh, we can see on here this sort of uh, black sort of <laughs> hypoechoic and speckled bit here is all pus. And um, the gentleman was significantly happy once I drained some of it, although I didn't drain all of it. But I got of latte sort of stuff out <laughs> to, <laughs> um, to send for culture. Um, unfortunately, when you are doing sort of ward-based um, ward in ultrasounds and interventions in a country at the height of COVID pandemic, I was out there at the very, very peak. Um, and the Gambia is obviously a West African country and they've been preparing for, for pandemics for a while. Ebola pandemics. And so they really didn't do um, PPE by halves. Um, so this was any anyone who was suspected of COVID, this was what we uh, what we went into our <laughs> wards with. And if you are sitting in uh, West African, West African heat, um, doing a fiddly little intervention, it taught me that I was significantly more built for north of England rather than, <laughs> than African temperatures. Pretty gross. Seriously, part of most of my uh, my my role there was in teaching and education. And so monthly they would have a, a meeting, uh, an X-ray meeting, where the, the clinicians there described it as the blind leading the blind. So I would be um, so they would talk about difficult cases and all sit there and nod and say it's difficult, don't know what's going on. And so despite me not at the time being a consultant, I still had a lot of imaging experience. So I could teach them and I could improve their their ability to interpret their own x-rays. So that was part of what we were doing to make it sustainable. But the, the, the goal of doing this sort of global health work is to, it's really, really easy to go and do your thing, do some good work, feel like you're doing a really, really great job, disappear and at the best, there's no change. And at worst, you've made things worse. So we didn't want to do that that is trying to establish a way that we can really really continue to support the MRC and to do that we linked up with a with an organization called collective well, a company called collective minds and they do a they have an online portal system that's basically a, a PAX so a, a, a online radiology system because of all of those boxes that we've ticked with the MRC having its uh, its PAX system already having all of these things that are in place they were really good guinea sort of trial to establish this is is this a workable model in in low and middle income countries 
So while I was there, we uploaded our first cases. <clears throat> and that meant that now that I'm home, I can I continue to uh, to interpret their their studies um, myself and Dr. Dodge, who's a consultant in in Brighton, and we continue to lead the the monthly meetings. So we have a, a monthly MDT radiology MDT. Uh, that, so any they upload to this platform, we can look at them and give an opinion and give teaching and education through that meeting as well. So that continues to this day. So I'm probably overrunning, but I'll be while I was also out there, I also wanted to um, get involved with not just this like sanitized, lovely, well, well, sort of well um, provisioned MRC unit. I also wanted to get try and get involved in the local healthcare system and that. So I spent a day a week in Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital. It took me an embarrassing amount of time to to realize that this is a teaching hospital named after a really cool uh, Gambian trade unionist called Edward Francis Small. It's not a small teaching hospital named after someone called Edward Francis. <laughs> it was quite small, but... Uh, <laughs> and that this is their tertiary center. A variety of surgical specialties. There's no surgery done in the MRC. So orthopedics, neuro, they do have a neurosurgeon um, and they've got some ophthalmology. Um, obstetrics and gynecology, peds, um, and weirdly, um, it's really easy to get dialysis in the Gambia. I think one of the uh, the old um, president's family members had renal failure, and so weirdly, dialysis you can get. And really provision in EFSTH, as I'll call it, is from this slightly more sprawling and slightly less organised um, sort of imaging department. And at the time that I was there, there was a, a visiting Nigerian professor in radiology who she was also helping to improve um, radiology provision there. But the vast majority of the work was done by people like Dr. Adalis, who is a Cuban radiologist. And if people have done global health be work before, Cuba has a big outreach sort of uh, system in order to provide or support healthcare work in, um, in other countries. Dr. Adalis initially went out for a year. Um, at, when I met her, she was on her third year there <laughs> and was, was going home soon and was very much looking forward to that, but she was an absolute workhorse. And what sort of things could we get at the FSTH? I mean, we can get x-ray, but um, as I, in comparison to the, uh, to the MRC, these are x-rays that have printed off and are drying at the uh, outlet of the, uh, the air conditioning unit. <laughs> they were going to be sent with the patients to be kept in whatever conditions that they were. Um, I've shown this picture before, but this was my ultrasound machine. It's a slightly dated, slightly crumbling little thing. This was my my unit that I worked on while I was there using a, um, a slightly bizarre sort of 3D obstetric probe that we just used for everything because that was the only probe that we had. Um, so not ideal. But there was a CT scan. Um, and I say ish there, um, the six months that I was there, the CT scanner was working for about three weeks. <laughs> um, the CT scanner that we had, as I say, this is a two slice scanner into the non radiologists. So in the sort of NHS, we're usually working with sort of 64 slice scanners, 128 slice scanners. So this is probably from the sort of late 90s, early 2000s, maybe even earlier. Ideally, we'd like when we're taking that, we've got that study, it'll be sent off and it'll be, uh, it'll be, we can review it on a, on a reporting station or PACS monitor. But no, all of the image interpretation is done from this computer here, which is this here, which is the, the, the console, the, the CT console. So you can't scan and interpret at the same time. You have to scan, look at the images, get a, get a radiologist looking through them, get a report, and then you can do another patient. The teaching hospital also has an MRI scanner. I do not have a picture of the MRI scanner because in the six months that I was there, it did not work. <laughs> and it hadn't been working for several years. But when it does work, it's a, we, we measure the, the strength of, well, an MRI scanner is based on this, the strength of its magnet. Um, so they have a 0.35 Tesla MRI scanner. In the UK, I mean, I think Leeds, so the LGI has one of the oldest scanners 
the MRI scanners still working in the NHS, and that's a 1.5 Tesla. Some lucky places have a, a three Tesla MRI, and some research facilities have seven Tesla MRI. Um, this was a, it wasn't even a donut, it was a, it was two flat plates. So the, they technically have an MRI scanner, but because of all of the problems we've, we've looked at, for all intents and purposes, they. Anyway, I thought just to finish off, I will show some cases. I don't know if that's use, interesting or useful, but, um, uh, and these are all coming through the MRC. Um, we have a 35 year old gentleman, so someone just a couple of years younger than me, um, who for more than half of his, or just under half of his life has had a cough. He was incredibly cachectic when we saw him with a BMI of 13.6. And when his, we did his X, it looked like that. <laughs> Again, to the non-radiologically minded, not normal. <laughs> So yeah, this is a frankly abnormal x-ray, especially for a 35 year old. And it's the sort of changes that you don't see in the UK at all. Left lung is a tent essentially, there's no functional lung there. This shadow here, this opacity is his mediastinum that's entirely shifted into his left hemithorax. There's some, in the left apex, there's, you can't really see any lung parenchyma there at all. And again, in the right apex, there's this big sort of cavity buller thing here. What rem remains of functioning lung has hyper expanded on the right. So it's pushing into, it's crossing his midline. And there's probably some acute infective changes there as well. He did have a CT and that all confirms these changes. But in a 35 year old, this is frankly abnormal, catastrophic, um, and probably almost certainly as a result of long standing and untreated tuberculosis not something that to this severity that you see in um in the uk so that's the sort of thing that was just walking through the door i am by no means a pediatric radiologist and in fact i have never done pediatric radiology but i was the radiologist there so we had to make do we had a year old boy who came in with his mum who was severely unwell vomiting fevers and severe malnutrition so he was losing weight at a rate of knots and his chest x-ray when we first did it looked like this it's pretty weird and as i say from the uh, perspective of a non-pediatric radiologist we've got some acute changes up in this space there's some patchy changes all through this left lung and when we looked at i took this to be some sort of atelectasis some sort of collapse but when we spoke to his mum and when he was on the ward all of the the clinical team were pretty worried because every time he was feeding, his neck was bulging out. Pretty weird. Um, so I, we sat on this, I was, wasn't quite sure what to do. And in the UK, we'd do some sort of fluoroscopic study. We'd get the expert pediatric radiologist involved. They'd talk to pediatric surgeons, but we didn't have any of that. What a bottle of oral contrast. Um, and his mum was pretty willing to, to help him drink it. So we decided to do that find out what was going on when he when he fed whenever we do we give him someone contrast we do another control film and you can see that all of those infective changes in his lungs have have progressed so all of this is all consolidation more consolidation here probably due to aspiration but you can see those weird linear lines that i took to be a bit of collapse look a bit different and you could almost be forgiven for saying that this looks a bit like a uh, this is air in where air shouldn't be. It could possibly be pericardial or pneumomediastinum. I didn't look at this before we gave, I wasn't around and they didn't, they just proceeded to give him contrast. Luckily they did, because when we gave him contrast, that was what we found. So when he was swallowing, it, all of this oral contrast was collecting in a really, really saggy dilated esophagus, vanishingly rare in, in, in a one-year-old boy, but this, this kid has achalasia, <laughs> severe stenosis at his gastroesophageal junction, although there is some coming into his stomach here. So he got sent off to the pediatric surgeons in EFSTH, but um, weird, not the sort of thing that you see in the UK or certainly very rare. Um, and finally, last case, um, a 55-year-old who came in with a long-standing, well, relatively actually um, onset back pain and was really, really struggling to walk. No sensory level. Blood, 
couple of cultures were positive and plain film, plain film isn't normal. Um, we've got a lateral view of a spine here, L5, L4, and you can see at L4, this lower end plate of this vertebrae is pretty dodgy looking, pretty eaten away. And you can, you can see, you can nicely trace it there. You can't trace that there. But time to fix the MRI scan. So this is more of a, just a proof of concept that actually with this knackered old 0.35 Tesla MRI scanner, which got really decent sort of uh, decent uh, diagnostic quality. Um, and you can see that as, as we probably suspected, and from this imaging, we can see we've got loads of edema in these two vertebral bodies. We've lost that disc, but what wasn't apparent there, we've got disc material protruding into the spinal cord osseous fragments there causing cord equina compression but just as a proof of concept actually really really nice image <laughs> considering the the technological limitations so that's nearly me done um just as some final thoughts i think was this worth it so certainly talking to the clinical team at the mrc and the fsth they appreciated my input and certainly the ongoing relationship that i have with them i think is really beneficial to them but personally, there were some cons. I had to take six months out of training, so I should have been a consultant eight months ago. To take that into account. I had six months where I have a very, very patient partner who uh, who paid the mortgage and looked after the cat. And <laughs> I my my board and my travel was was paid for by the MRC and I got a small stipend from Worldwide Radiology, but I had to take that into account. And I had six months away from family and friends, and that included Christmas. Yeah, and it included my birthday. So again, very, very patient uh, partner. Probably the biggest con um, was that I had six months of old, terrible showers. <laughs> but ultimately, it was, again, as I alluded to earlier, this is a really unique experience amongst radiologists. I don't know many people apart from myself, Liz, and a couple of others who've done something like this. And so this experience is and is that will hopefully stand me in good stead in my future career. Um, I got to live in the, as I was saying to some of you, I consider myself having lived in the Gambia rather than just visited because I was there as part of the furniture. People got to know me and I felt like I was integrating into a new culture and lifelong personal and professional relationships. As I say, the ongoing relationship with the MRC is something that I really value. Um, so yeah, I think it was worth it. Um, I'm not here to solicit anyone. I'm not here to people do want to help i think completely impartially worldwide radiology does a really good really good job um so if you are sort of looking for a tax write-off or looking for a, a good cause to uh to donate to i think that they're really good um on a more sort of individual basis the mrc has a patient access fund they significantly subsidize treatments and the investigations that they do but things like ct scans and mri scans are quite expensive there so they have a, a fund to for patients who can't imaging or, or treatment elsewhere and if people know people coming through training the mrc is partially uh, bolstered by by volunteers and if people are looking for somewhere that's really supported really interesting and really really great to work um through either sort of after after careers or people in sort of more junior levels i think it's something that's really really worth um worth it's a really worthwhile place to work and there were other benefits of months in the Gambia as well it's a pretty terrible place to to live you know two minutes walk from the beach amazing uh amazing birds and wildlife amazing friends and yeah it's a generally pretty lovely place to work thank you for your time I'll leave that up thanks Ed um you're very so um I'm going to a few more words okay. now, but then we've got a vote of thanks from, from uh, 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 Sarah over there. So what, what we'll do is just take in some questions, first of all. Um, so um, uh, any questions from the floor at all that people want to ask? Right, okay, well, we'll start with you, Andy. Hey, that's really enjoyable. Do you still want to do the work with those of that? Absolutely, yeah. And it's something that I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, you stand there. Yeah. So whether I want to do work with, with global health in the future as part of my consultant career, absolutely. And it's something that I will 
um, hopefully build into future job planning. Um, I think that as a sort of the NHS, I think it's a, a big accolade for a, a, an institution to be able to, to work in global health. I think it's something that we should all be striving to. I think it's something that we, it looks really good and it should be something that we all, hospitals in the NHS should be working towards in order to support. We historically have taken a lot of workers and various resources from low and middle income countries. And I think that it's in our duty to, to give back some of that. That's the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mentioned this here because other people might not be aware, but your hospital has an active global health um, set up. Yeah, and I heard and people emailed me with that. And then when your last meeting I was there, I had COVID, so I couldn't come. <laughs> but I was planning on going to the, to a, to the meeting. Absolutely, please and do. The other things, you know, three or four of these people set up a charity in your Mm. which provides electronic medical records for the developing world. Um, and it's free at the point of delivery. They've been out there frequently to Uganda, mm. to spread it around lots of countries. Um, and they would be delighted to work, I'm sure, with radiology to look at a way of uploading radiological images and developing further in, in, in conjunction with uh, I can, I can um, imagine that that would be very useful and <laughs> hopefully we will be in touch. Yeah, be, yeah that sounds great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah, I mean, um, it, we're all aware that it happens and it's not something that I think we should be striving for. I think that that's, it's taking away from much more needful um, places. But I hate to say that sort of from an individual perspective and talking to people who sort of the radiographers in, in the Gambia, a lot of them want to come and work in the UK because, because fi financially, um, but also for training. Um, so one of the radiographers that I work with, when he came to, he, the Ni Raphael, who's Nigerian, came to work in the Gambia, and all of these other radiographer friends were just like, nah, you're going to the UK, aren't you? <laughs> Come on. And he was, no, I'm going, my brother works in the Gambia, that's where I'm going. But he recognises that actually if he came to the UK, he could get trained really, become better at his job. And he would, he says that he would always want to go back, but actually coming for some training. So there is some scope there. And you can't deny that for financial reasons, these individuals are highly trained and it's a, a, an open market. Um, but it's not something that we should be striving for. And it's, there is a move towards sort of shoring up the, uh, our, our staffing problems with, with recruitment tribes over there, which is not something that we should be aiming for. It's a difficult question, but it's ultimately it's a negative thing to be doing. Well said. Uh, it's just sort of a kind of technical question, but I'm just conscious of this um, little gadget here and these enormous pieces of equipment that are hugely expensive and don't work most of the time. Is there, is, do you think the scope for, I mean, this used to be 20 years ago, very much bigger than it is now. Oh. And is there a scope of rethinking imaging in the sense of what can you do with, with uh, cheaper so when I came, went out there, I the the charity bought me a um, what this is a by company called Butterfly, and this is an ultrasound scanner that has all built in sort of different types of probe. You can do sort of cardiac scanning, abdominal scanning, sort of soft tissue scanning, all from that. Um, this together cost a couple of grand. Um, so that sort of thing is was unheard of five years ago. Um, is the quality as good as a full departmental scanner? Absolutely not, but it's, it's pretty diagnostic. It's pretty great. And once you've got your eye in, and that has the added benefit of being their system uploads to the internet. So you can also, you can dynamically scan and you can have someone back at home, back in the UK, looking at what you're scanning. Um, so I, I don't know where technology is going to go in the future, what sort of things we're able to do, but that is just proof of concept. But absolutely, that's you can also plug them into your phone. So you don't need a full tablet. You 
you just can plug it into your phone and you can do a scan. So absolutely. Um, it would be interesting to see what what else is coming, but that's been really, really, really useful. Not the main doing the surgery. Thank you very much. What disease areas do you think? Um, so historically the, the the health problems in places like the Gambia has been communicable diseases. Um so so things like the TB case that I showed you, so malaria. And that, so historically, that's, that's, they're the big killer. Um, but there's increasing recognition that non-communicable things like non-communicable airways diseases, so everyone cooking on fires in, in closed houses. So I, where can radiology sort of have an impact? Everything. So I saw a couple of case, really nasty cases of pediatric cancers that I haven't seen before, but scanning a kid's belly, well, yeah, that's a, that's a big Wilms tumour. Um, ultimately, these people would have not had these diagnoses without radiology input. So I, I don't think we can be focused in, oh, no, we need more head and neck radiologists. We need more breast radiologists. We need more. Um, ultimately, they just need some general imaging provision. Um, and I think that once there's the, the general then actually we can start focusing and actually you know there's a huge there's a huge need for chest specialists because of the TB problems. But I think we're a bit away from that because there's just so much need for radiology in general. And not even radiologists, but just the the narrowing that imaging sort of that imaging inequality. Sorry, I don't know if that answered your question, but <laughs> Uh, the big plus from well, the use of x rays was in the treatment of fractures. Because hmm. there were a lot of fractures people having sacks or ships and so on, stopping themselves. There were a lot of fractures that are very poorly treated on the whole. And people somewhat improved with the use of very simple x ray equipment. Yeah. But is that still happening? In Absolutely. So trauma is very much a thing there. Um, and we had the best X-ray setup of, of the entire of the Gambia. Um, so if people were had trauma but were stable, had a had a fracture, they would come to the MRC to get their to get their X-ray done and then go to the orthopedic surgeons in the MR in because we had the best sort of setup. They could get the best diagnostic imaging. Um so it's you could look at it as sort of almost in a sort of burgeoning healthcare sort of the the sort of area that we were pre-war because if you have a if you have a fracture and you're living up country there's no chance of getting to get you're probably just going to let that heal how it heals and have the morbidity associated with that um but that comes with proximity not only to the x-ray but also to the the two orthopedic surgeons who are in the country and the one sort of trauma center which is not really a trauma center by our understanding of the word but it's where if you have trauma in the gambia that's where you're going to want to go because there's a neurosurgeon and an orthopedic surgeon um so it's certainly not isolated to radiology it's health inequality one small uh, supplementary uh what happens to the tourists who are attending <laughs> <laughs> um, often would come to the MRC and pay, uh, be not supplemented like the local Gambian population. Um, things like a lot of the um, the armed forces have um, have uh, uh, bases there, and so they would come for their cups in in their chest X rays would come to the MRC because we had the best setup, and that would be used to help supplement the uh, or to help. Um, pay for for the more local because their their governments would pay for so ultimately if it was something serious if it's something serious usually the tourists would um would get lifted out and go to senegal or or ghana or one of the more established and yeah. um yes at the back there so i just wonder is there any how do they Popular Gambia see radiology and imaging in general. Is there other any cultural 
barriers, any magical, superstitious, or religious barriers to, to having imaging. You know, this could be as its own cultural uh, issues as well. But uh, did you come across any more where they were resistant, or they thought of it as a in, in a way that was a slightly suspicious of, of what you're doing? Because it can to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, not specifically to radiology, but to Western medicine, definitely. And occasionally you would find patients who were more superstitious, who would have tried a variety of local healing and sort of witchcraft sort of uh, treatments and have progressed to the point that they were desperate. And then finally you'd find patients coming who were who were really, really in a, in a pretty, pretty poor way. And their final sort of last, last act of desperation is coming to Western medicine and coming to the MRC because that's that was known as sort of somewhere that was that was good. Obviously, there is some sort of skepticism about the MRC linked into its colonial past, and there's there's rumours that no, you don't go to the MRC because they steal your blood. They they'll take blood and they'll 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 sell it. Um, the, again, that's part of the the kind of cultural sort of buy-in that you have to try and you have to try and earn the trust because of obviously all of the history can't really blame people for not really trusting uh, but that's that's part of the work that we have to do how is the mrc funding so so the MRC, my understanding is that it um, it's funded through scientific grants through sort of through. Um, um, I think they also sort of have their own grant system and things like that. And the MRC is a really really big sort of organisation. They've got groups all over the all over the world, probably in Africa, various other places, lots in the UK. Um, and the clinical side of things was supplemented by the research side of things because in order to do the research the clinical there so part of their funding went into the clinical um the clinical unit there does that that whether whether scientific funding is stable uh as the mrc is a is a really really prestigious and sort of large institution so if it's going to be stable anywhere it will be stable there and their research output has been really really strong um they would be wanting to keep that as the the unit there going as much as possible so i think as stable as it can be Enjoy it, and one thing about Cuba is is they're how remarkable they are. They're educating people, educating people, and with the outreach program, do they go there for a long time? Doctors? So, Doctor Adalis and the the other two Cubans who were there, um, it, for a year, essentially, um, but because of what happened in the world and COVID, um, she got slightly stranded out there and was was there for three years um a lot of the medical education so gambia has its own medical school um and a lot of their education is done by by cuban doctors as well so during that time gambian doctors faltered because they couldn't get new cuban doctors out um so that they, they do have a, a short-term period that they're there but obviously with what's been happening that did was uh prolonged slightly for some individuals Okay. Shall we move on to, to uh, Virgil Franks now? Thank you. No, I'm sorry, this one. Well, thanks very much, Ed. Welcome back to York. And I'm sure everyone in the radiology department in York will be really pleased that you are uh, starting there on Monday. Um, you're obviously very dedicated. It's um, obviously you've had this fantastic experience, which can only have improved your skills as a doctor as well. It helps to have someone on, on a team who can think outside the box. And also, I'm sure it's always useful to have someone um, who's used to working in a low resource environment. We like to complain about the NHS, but really, I mean, we are so well off compared to other countries like this, and we, we shouldn't complain as much as we do. A lot of what we complain about are things that aren't visible 
Um, whereas a lot of the deficiencies in, in the healthcare system you've been in are very visible indeed. Um, I was very interested about the, uh, the ultrasound that you discussed. Um, so ultrasound in this country was introduced really in the early to mid 70s and it took a while to get acceptance. And I remember even when I was a radiology trainee in the 90s and um, there were some clinicians who just didn't accept it at all. And one of them, in fact, called it hocus pocus. So I was interested in the, the acronym that, that you had. Yeah, uh, very anti ultrasound. And yet, I remember a senior registrar saying to me, "Watch out for ultrasound. There's always going to be improvements in ultrasound. Uh, all the rest um, are going to struggle to keep up with improvements in in ultrasound and how useful it is and how underappreciated it is." And certainly, if you had to take something to a desert island, you'd want an ultrasound machine, wouldn't you? Um, and obviously, I mean, fantastic that they even had any MR scanner, but it's quite obvious that probably it wouldn't be working. I'm not surprised. Whereas I'm sure the ultrasound, it's, it's a sort of quiet, very important uh, thing. Yes. Um, also, fantastic that you were so involved in education, and there's lots of um, of scope for that everywhere. And uh, I think education has an exponential value in what it can pass on, and particularly somewhere um, where they've got hardly any uh, personnel, and everyone's probably really keen to learn, and they can pass on what you tell them. So fantastic. Work had with um, with sort of world um, health, and uh, obviously maybe you can get the X-ray department at York to be uh, participants in that. So as I say, welcome and good luck. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you.